are the best decks in Yu-Gi-Oh right now. This video is made for a player returning back into the game or wants the update on some important things that have been happening over the weekend since Battles of Legends Terminal Revenge. I think that there are some strategies and trends that may shock you that I'm gonna update you on. And of course, big dog, for the people that just may want a little bit more, I'll be putting personal deck list on my Patreon as a special thank you for helping me pay my editors. Let's go ahead and jump on in. What's going on with ya, big dog? And it is an amazing day for you, yo. I hope that your day phenomenal. But if it isn't, don't let what happened at the beginning of your day ruin the rest of your day. And speaking of days, big dog, it actually is a day, a day. A particular series where we talk about something to help you grow not only as a player, but as a person, because that's just a little bit more important. So this weekend, my uncle actually took me on to a breakfast and he let me know on some game that I want to pass on to you. He told me that failing to plan is planning to fail. I swear to God, old people always got these monikers, but they work if you genuinely think about it. Basically, my uncle told me I'm a loser in so many words because I failed to make an actual game plan. I was already planning to fail in the main event. And to be honest with you guys, before he gave me this advice, that's pretty much what I was doing with my entire life. I didn't make a plan for anything. Kids, videos, taxes, don't tell the IRS. And unfortunately, when you don't make those plans, you don't succeed as you want them. But ironically, if you do make those plans, you will see the difference in your success rate. So basically what I'm saying, instead of walking up to that girl and asking her out a date, actually make a plan. I mean, she still might tell you no, but at least you were prepared, right? And that's exactly what we're talking about when it comes to these particular Yu-Gi-Oh decks. We already know that Snake Eyes is still a tier zero deck, but if we don't plan for this deck and other strategies, then we're gonna be SOL. And that actually brings me to the update you probably need to know about because Snake Eyes now has an FTK. See, the new way to play Snake Eyes is to summon Blaze Phoenix Bombardment using Proxy F Magician's effect to fusion summon with a Snake Eyes monster and a Draco Sack token, which is the exact requirements. From there, you put 10 cards on your side of the field, something that the deck can do incredibly well, and loop the effect of Blaze Phoenix Bombardment using its effect, then summoning it back with Promethean Princess, then summoning it back with World Sea Lances to be able to do over 8,000 damage because even if you do interact with this and hand trap them, they can then just make a regular Snake Eyes board. And there's only genuinely two to three cards that they need to change inside of their extra deck to be able to facilitate this consistently. I think that FTKs are one of the most ridiculous things in the game, but when you already give the best deck in Yu-Gi-Oh a way to win before we could even play, you would probably say that, yeah, we're deserving of a ban list. But this isn't about ban lists. This is about updating you guys because there have been some strategies that have been able to consistently stop Snake Eyes. You see, when Snake Eyes isn't FTK, which may be a way that I want you guys to be aware about, it's actually incredibly weak to board breaker cards. And if you were to ask me, some of the best board breaker cards are Dark Ruler and Amor and even Match. These cards are amazing. They do have a problem that you need to be able to set up a board to be able to stop Snake Eyes on turn three, but that isn't the end of the world. With that being said, the rest of this video is dedicated to strategies that can really put the hurting on Snake Eyes, but more importantly, take advantage of the hand traps and board breakers that are really good right now. Now, I do think that Tenpai Dragon is one of the most dangerous decks in the game. It's ridiculous. Tenpai Dragon being able to play a combination of powerful hand traps and board breakers to be able to slow down the opponent just enough to beat them. And what makes the deck so dangerous is that as a Tenpai Dragon player, you want to go second. Fortunately enough, there's nothing incredibly new about this deck, but I have to acknowledge it as it is the second best deck in the game. Now, there's nothing necessarily new with Tenpai Dragon other than players playing a combination of board breakers and hand traps, but I think that that's a basis for a lot of the strategies that we're going to be talking about as well. Take for example, Sprite, which just won the South American World Championship qualifiers, is kind of going crazy. I'm not 100% sure if Sprite has what it takes on a consistent level. I'm gonna have to do a lot more testing, but what I do know about Sprite is that Battles of Legends Terminal Revenge has made the deck a lot stronger. Because of the new monster Mirror Mage of the Ice Barrier, the deck is a lot more powerful. It means that summoning Swap Frog from your hand to be able to send Mirror Mage can get you freezing chains of the Ice Barrier to summon Mirror Mage right back. 
And since both of those monsters are aqua monsters, being able to make totally awesome right there is huge. It can not only stop your opponent's important hand traps, but also can snatch your opponent's spell and trap cards so you can use them for your own. But that's not exactly where Sprite stops. I think the best thing about Sprite is that hand traps were never really great against it, but now this deck can build its board with multiple one card combos. Because of the Mirror Mage monster, both Swap Frog and Sprite Starter allow you to make some pretty cool one card combos, summoning monsters like the Dejin Buster, and even using the Sprite cards like Sprite Sprint, it doubles cost to your advantage alongside of Totally Awesome. Essentially, the deck has very simple and easy to make boards. Again, I'm not a thousand percent sure if I put Sprite in the best Yu Gi Oh decks, but it winning a national championship does give it reason to consider. And what makes it even cooler, the more level twos, the stronger the deck gets. But the other Yu-Gi-Oh strategies I'm going to be talking about do a really good job at being able to combat the top two. Let's look at the new strategy that just got support from Battles of Legends Terminal Revenge, Yubel. This deck is actually crazy good right now. Yubel actually addresses a few problems that we've been having inside of this format and forces players to think different on their toes. You remember when I said board breakers like Dark Ruler No More and Evenly Matched were incredibly good? Well, they are good against Snake Eyes, but they're way more impactful against Yubel because hand traps just don't simply work. Yubel challenges challenges the theory that you have to run 15 hand traps in this Yu-Gi-Oh format because they make every single one look completely useless. And it's mainly because of the new card, Phantom of Yubel. Just when you thought that Konami couldn't get more ridiculous on how to summon a Yu-Gi-Oh card, having to be able to shuffle a monster from your graveyard back into your deck to summon a free monster that can stop effects on the field and turn it to furthering your strategy is kind of ridiculous. But if we were to stop right there, Yubel wouldn't be as competitive. So of course there's four. I find it interesting what a lot of Yubel players have been doing with their inboards. It can summon really powerful monsters like the Phantom of Yubel that I mentioned before, Verugis, and Unchained Soul of Rage, but what some players have been opting to do is summon Nightmare Griffin into their main monster zone and the middle one so it's not linked to anything. This means that pretty much any time our opponent special summons a monster, it won't be able to activate its effect. Meanwhile, if we special summon monsters, all we have to do is point it to the Griffin and it can gain its effects. It almost mimics what Snake Eyes does with Skill Drain, except it's a little bit more one-sided, and you have a monster that's 2500 attack and really hard to beat. And on top of being a deck that can easily play through hand traps and summon unfair monsters, Yubel has one more trick up its sleeve to win the game. See how the strategy works is that it's based on zero attack monsters. And I don't know about you, but I'm never scared of a zero attack monster until now. Because of the unique effect of Phantom Nightmare, Yubel does not have to break your bolt. It actually wants you to have monsters on your field so it can inflict a ton of damage with its Yubel monsters by attacking it to them. It creates situations that are incredibly unfavorable for the opponent, and that's why the strategy is just doing so well right now. Yubel reminds me of my mother. She only takes from you when you have something. Damn, I really need that therapy. Another deck that I was really surprised that made the top cut, but makes so much sense in this current format, is Pearly. Now you guys have heard me cope on Pearly before. But please the best deck, I swear. It got gaps. They got the dog in. You summon an unaffected monster in there. You but I think the top at the Oceanic event, as well as some others, has turned me back into a believer with Pearl. See, before we were relying on hand traps to be able to stop our opponent, but now that we know we can use a combination of hand traps and board breakers, Pearly becomes a lot stronger. See, what's really good about Pearly is that it plays against the best decks in the game incredibly well. A really good Pearly player can play around hand traps, including Dimension Shifter, and I think another one of the best things about it is that it can easily get rid of monsters without triggering their effects. Monsters like Flame the Urge need to be able to go to the graveyard. But once Pearly attaches that monster as material, it not only removes the threat, but also prevents the opponent from gaining those bonus effects to summon from the graveyard. And keep in mind, when Flame Beurge is detached as a material, it's not being sent from the field to the graveyard. It won't get its effect. It puts Snake Eyes players on a clock to be able to get back their resources and also addresses one of their biggest threats. I also think that X Pearly Noir is a huge threat, not only because it can get rid of cards on the field, but also the graveyard. If you notice some of the best decks in the game need their graveyard to be able to continue playing and having an easy out to be able to get rid of those cards can be detrimental to the opponent and let's now also add that those secondary effects of your pearly spell cards are literally insane we've already talked about attaching this material but what about drawing cards, making your monster being able to attack multiple times, to even giving your monsters a huge buff of attack and defense? I think that the innate immunity to a lot of cards right now is what makes Pearly really powerful. 
But the last strategy I think is just incredibly powerful. To be honest with you, it might be the second best deck in the room until Infinite Forbidden comes out. That strategy is easily Ritual Beast because it simply has all of its bases covered. I think some of the greatest things about Ritual Beast is that it did fix a lot of issues with the deck. Needing a Ritual Beast Tamer and a Spiritual Beast Monster is incredibly hard. But when you have monsters like Spiritual Beast Tamer Laura that can serve as either, but also be able to summon any Ritual Beast monster monster from your deck to your side of the field, it's huge. And then just like Pearly, it also has targeting protection with the new fusion monster in Mitchuri Draco. But again, just like some of the other strategies, I don't think that it stops there. See, Ritual Beast is really good at being able to put a multitude of monsters into the graveyard with different types and attributes. It's also a strategy that when needed, can summon almost every attribute to your side of the field. And since Ritual Beast does specializing in banishing monsters, it means that the Nemesis engine is completely bonkers inside of this deck. Now I didn't notice it when I tested Ritual Beast, but as you can see in that testing game, it was a really strong deck steal. Adding the Arc Nemesis cards take it over the top, and it's for a couple of reasons. The biggest one is that the Arc Nemesis monsters are always summonable as long as you can play Ritual Beast. But being able to search Arc Nemesis Protos to be able to declare fire completely shuts decks like Snake Eyes down. Coolly enough, there's also lines where you can declare Dark, Light, and even, well, of course, Wind. And Wind may not seem like much, but when you realize Opelousa is a wind monster and that card could be a threat from time to time you can declare win but just like what I said with you bell if I were to stop there the deck would probably be pretty cool but not strong enough I think alongside being the best shifter deck as well as playing Arcanemus's Protos the deck can also easily summon Thunder Dragon Colossus I promise you I'm not coping this time because the deck already plays the Nemesis engine being able to get Nemesis Corridor from your deck to your hand is a breeze it's actually searchable through your Nemesis flag which which can be searched through your Flames and Banshee, which only requires two level four monsters to be summoned to your side of the field. After activating the effect of Nemesis Corridor, you can use that monster for your Thunder Dragon Colossus, but just in case your opponent thought that that was the only way, Spiritual Beast Conahawk is also a Thunder monster that can be used. I think that this meta that we're having between now and Infinite Forbidden is really interesting. Yes, we still have to deal with the tier zero Snake Eyes, but we're starting to see a lot more diversity with other Yu-Gi-Oh strategies and Battles of Legends Terminal Revenge having an impact. If you guys think that there's some other strategies, I can't wait to see what you have to say. Let me know down below. And also be sure to check out these videos so I can catch you on the next one.